the recipe for revival. So I feel like revival in the past, especially in the past few months, has been such like a trending word. We've probably heard it a bunch. You're seeing revival sparking out in these places, and you see college kids and campuses all over the nation. People are having these revival services and these revival moments, and they're staying for days without end. They're coming and going. People are flying in from all over the country to experience these different types of revival, and I want to know what our response is to that. What does that look like for us? Is revival actually stirring your heart to do something more? Or when you see somebody encountering God in a new way, is it like, man, go them. That's so great. You share the video, man, that's awesome. And then it's back to our regular scheduled programming. And so I wanted to, I remember praying, getting ready for this a few weeks ago, and I wanted to kind of study and look up revivals. We know if you took history class for some of us, that was years and years ago. But when we learned about different great awakenings, you had the first great awakening, the second, the third, you had different people and different evangelists all the way from the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. There were these moments where it was widespread all over the world where revival would spark out and the Lord would start moving in ways that the people of that time and generation hadn't seen happen before. And so somebody that I was kind of looking at and came across was a guy by the name of John Wesley. Does anybody know who that is? I heard somebody go, yeah. John Wesley. So John Wesley was a European guy in the 1700s who sparked revival. He was deemed as an evangelist, right, when that term, I guess, was getting kind of popular and used. He traveled all around Europe, sparked revival, and this was before, obviously, internet and phones and all these things. And somehow, the people in the U.S. in the 1700s heard about what John Wesley was doing out in the U.K., I believe, and they also started experiencing revival. And they just read about it. They couldn't even see the videos like we see today of people, you know, praying and crying out and calling out. All they did was read about this guy, John Wesley, who was sparking revival all over the place. And they also decided to partake in that because they said, if God is doing something, then I don't want to miss what he's doing. I want to also experience that thing. And so, hey, yo, what was that? Hey, yo, I like that. That's a new one. Hey, yo, hey, I'll take, I'll take that. Can I get an hey, yo? Amen. I thought everybody was going to do it. Never mind. It's all good. That's your thing. And so fast forward to the year 1940. And there's a school, Wheaton College, and there's a professor by the name of Professor Orr. O-R-R. You can look him up. Real story. This is his account. And he took a group of students over to Europe to go visit the home. And he had his home and like his study, his ministry of John Wesley out in the UK. So Professor Orr takes a group of students. They're going, they're looking through his library. It's his, his library, it's big, it's massive, it's illustrious. There's so many books, there's so many things. They're going through his study, and then he takes the students up into his bedroom. And then they look, there's books on the bedroom, there's Bibles everywhere, so many things. His stuff from the 1700s, all still there. And then they go over to the side of the bed, And in the carpet, there are two worn out, almost to the cement, patches right next to each other. And Professor Orr stops and he says, guys, can anybody tell me what this is? And nobody knew what it was. And he was like, this is said to be the spot where John Wesley, every morning and every night, spent hours without end praying for revival to come. So much so that the carpet and the threads in the carpet were so worn out that you could see the cement in two patches. That for 35, 40 or so years of his ministry, every single day, for hours, in the morning and at night, he would put his knee in these two circles and he'd pray. And obviously over time, those spots got more worn and more worn and more worn and he prayed for revival. He said, God, We want to see revival. He has notes and journals of of it everywhere. We want to see revival. I want to see revival in my time. All the kids, I'm sure, were fascinated. And then they leave, and they're going out. And Professor Orr, again, look this up. Story is so cool. Professor Orr gets on the bus, and he's given a head count of the students. And he notices that a student is gone. And so I don't know how he lost him in the first place. But he goes back. He's looking for this student. He looks through the library, the study all of those things, and he goes into the bedroom, and he sees a student kneeling down 
in the same two places where John Wesley was. And he says all he could hear the students saying was, do it again, Father. Do it again, Father. Do it again, Father. And do it through me over and over again. He said he stopped and he watched them for a minute. Do it again, Father. Do it through me. Do it again, Father. Do it through me. And so he goes and he taps him on the shoulder and he says, hey, we got to go. And Billy Graham got up and went back to the bus. He got up and went back to the bus, and God did it again through him, a college student. So again, I ask, what is our response to revival? What is our response to seeing and hearing revival, and what can that response birth? What can that response bring about? Because we're praying for revival. I feel like we've been, we say it every year at some point. Lord, bring revival. But what, is that, what does that even mean? Revival in what? Revival in who? Because if revival defined is just something that once was dead or no longer popular, becoming live and popular and common again, God, it didn't die off. The Holy Spirit didn't stop moving. So when we pray for revival, who are we praying for? What are we praying about? If you yourself are revived, then you yourself would initiate revival in others. It's what that, that age-old you saying, well, you catch on fire, anybody close to you is going to burn. But, like, for real, though. <laughs> and so, again, what is our response to revival? We know that God is omnipresent. We know that he's everywhere. We know that he's moving. But revival, in a sense, that we want to see and experience not just his omnipresence, but we want to experience his manifested presence. His manifested presence where we can actually see the power and the glory of God displayed in all the earth. I think we'd all agree that we are living in some very prophetic and crazy times in the globe. And we all believe that, but for whatever reason, we still have no response for revival. We still don't have a response. So I'm praying that today, today, Ayo, something would rise up inside of us that says, God, I want to have revival, and I want to know exactly what that means and what that looks like for me personally. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you so much that your spirit has never stopped moving. God, that you go where you're wanted, and people go where you're moving. And so, Father, we thank you that we would have a heart and a desire for revival, God, that we would want to see revival in our day, not just through us, but in us, in a way that says, God, come and do whatever you want to do, that your omnipresence isn't enough, Father. We want to see your manifested presence here on the earth. And so, God, do today whatever you want to do. Reveal to us what revival is in our own lives. Father, reveal to us what revival is in the lives of the people and of those that we encounter, impact, and influence. We receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. So the recipe for revival, if you're taking those, the first thing, the first thing, repentance and prayer. Repentance and prayer. Pastor Jason a few weeks ago shared a vision that he had from the Lord and shared that he believed that revival, the foundation of revival is going to come in on in the vehicle of repentance. Even if you look back in the Old Testament through Moses, it was just a pattern of, y'all, this is what God said. We ain't doing it. <laughs> Repent so that God can heal us. And we see this theme over and over again. Every prophet, we get to Malachi at the end. Hey, y'all, this is what Moses said, God said. We still not doing it. Repent and get back to what God is doing. Hundreds of years go by. God doesn't say anything. And then John the Baptist steps on the scene and says the same thing. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is upon us. That didn't change. What do we have to do to get into a state? If God's mercy is new every day, that means that there is something that I need to repent of to be able to receive and experience the mercy of God. And that repentance is what will fuel revival. And so when we talk about revival, obviously prayer is a very foundational thing. 
I don't know about you guys. I don't have any John Wesley patches in my home. What would that be like to get into a moment where I prioritize prayer so much that when I'm not praying, when I'm not in the presence of God, I cannot wait to go back? You ever be in church? Don't lie in here. The Lord's watching. You ever be in church and it's like the last 30 minutes or so and you making lunch and afternoon plans in your head? Like, man, he's probably got like 12 minutes left. <sighs> Boy, that place usually be packed by like 1230. Hmm. But if we don't make it there, what's our second option? Well, I wonder if they're going to come today. Maybe we shouldn't invite them so we could eat quicker. Like we go, like we've done it before. Yeah, <laughs> about to sit here and act like I'm talking crazy. We've done it. And so what if we had that same response? When it came to worship, when it came to prayer, when it came to repentance, that I'm in a moment and I'm just sitting there trying to stay focused because I'm like, man, I just can't wait to get back in the presence of God. I just can't wait to get back in the presence of God. Man, I'm so busy. It's been such a long day. But, man, I know as soon as the kids get put to bed, I'm going to be able to get in the presence of God. I can't wait to wake up and get in the presence of God. What are we hungry for? What are we desiring? We watch TV shows and get excited for next week's. I can't wait till next week. My clock is set. That show is going to be on. I'm not going to miss it as if it's not on demand. Like, I'm not going to miss it. I got to see the premiere. But we got the Lord just over here chilling, <laughs> waiting for us, waiting for us. And so in the scripture over 70 times, even in the New Testament, it mentions repentance as well as in the Old Testament. And there's a verse um, in 2 Chronicles 7.14. I love the Lord's talking to Solomon, asking him what's going on, or Solomon's asking him what's going on. The Lord gives Solomon a word, and in verse 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, repentance, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Then I'll heal their land. Do y'all feel like our land is healed right now? feel like that's a unanimous decision. So then why wouldn't we put ourselves in a position that says, God, I'm going to turn from my wicked ways. And some of y'all need a refreshed definition of wicked ways because <laughs> y'all think that wicked ways is just extreme sin and extreme things. Wicked ways could just be loving your neighbor. Just be loving your neighbor to turn from those things. And it says, I'll pour out my spirit and heal your land. And so in prayer, we see that all these moments, we have Jesus in the New Testament, we have prophets of old, we have the disciples getting away in prayer and putting themselves in a place of expectancy so that they can anticipate the thing um, that God is going to do next. And so, write this down also, what is the question that we have to ask, and the question that I had to ask and prep for this is, what is my role in revival? What is my role in revival? What am I doing personally in revival? Because most people don't move because they don't know what their role is. They don't know how to define it. They don't know what thing God told them to do. They don't know how to get God out of that box. Maybe you're sent. Maybe you're supposed to be interceding. Maybe you're supposed to be resourcing the kingdom. Maybe you're supposed to be doing something, but there is no bench in the kingdom of God. You either on the field or you're in the way. There's no sideline, but it's hard sometimes because we don't define what roles in revival are like they do in scripture to be able to contribute to what God is doing. Asbury College out in Kentucky had this massive five to eight day something revival. I'm sure everybody in here has heard about it at some point. If you got four young kids and you a full-time parent, you're not road tripping to Asbury to go spend three days <laughs> in prayer. But that does not mean that you don't have a role to play. That doesn't mean that you can do nothing and sit and say, great, good job, go Asbury students. That sure is awesome. I was reading Nehemiah 3, and we'll look at it here in a second, and Nehemiah hears from the Lord that he needs to rebuild 
the walls around Jerusalem, where the cities entered, that they'd been damaged in battle, that they'd been, uh, there was some fire damage on some of them. And he's saying, man, we need to rebuild this wall. This needs to happen for this community, for this city. And in Nehemiah 3, I love this, in Nehemiah 3, verse 1, it says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the tower of the hundred, as far as the tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Emery, built as well. And so I heard somebody talking about this and pointed out something amazing. For starters, I love that the first person that decided to build was the high priest. The high priest said, you know what? Hey, I'm going to go first. I'll set the example. Toss me one of them hammers. Toss me some of that clay. I got you. And if you go down this scripture, there's people from all over. They decided to build. The son of this person, they decided to build. The man next to him from Jericho, from another city, he decided to build. And I love in verse 8, if you skip down, it says, next to them, Uziel, the son of Horiah, goldsmith, repaired. So you got somebody who's a jeweler, and he's like, hey, man, I'm here. They said, great, what can you do? I mean, I can make some necklaces and stuff. Cool, here's a hammer. <laughs> you got a part to play. You've got a role to play. It's going to take all of us. And the next verse, it says, next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired. Hey, what's your name? Um, I'm Hananiah. Cool. What do you do? I mean, I make people smell good, you know. Dope. Here's a hammer. You got a part to play. There was nobody excluded from the high priest to the perfumer to the, to the jewelry maker. Every person said, and again, when you have time, go back and read Nehemiah 3. Every person this person was. This person repaired. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. You got leaders to jewelry makers because they said, hey, this thing needs to be built up because it affects all of us. And so regardless of what my role is in the natural, regardless of what my vocation is, I'm going to help build this thing because it is imperative that it is functioning in a way that benefits all of us. And in the same way, when we're thinking about revival, everybody has a part to play. And it is imperative that we all step into our roles so that revival can actually hit where we are. I'm, hey, what's, what, what do you do? Well, I mean, I'm just a school teacher and I just... Great. What's your hammer look like? We got to get revival built. Hey, man, what do you do? Well, you know, I'm just a business owner. I, you know, I really don't. Have you. Great. You got a role to play as well. What does your hammer look like? Have you ever took a moment and prayed and said, okay, God, I see revival happening. So many things are happening. People are moving. It's, it's stirring up everywhere. What am I actually supposed to do? What am I actually supposed to do? to do, not just in a corporate moment where, man, the Holy Spirit breaks out and you're like, this is great, and we can be in a setting like this and have no idea what everybody does in this space, people falling out in the Spirit, and this is great and awesome, and then you get to your bank job the next day, and it's like, man, it would be real nice if somebody could play those keys right now so that I could stir something up in this place. Like, what is your role? And so, again, if you didn't write that down, Right, please write down, pray about what my role is in reviver, revival. What is my role in revival? What does that look like? What does my hammer look like? Is it facilitating something? Is it praying for something? Is it going and doing something? What does that look like? And one thing that I also want to take note, a recipe for revival, is fasting. Is fasting. 80%, I think it was, of the body of Christ, according to like a Barna study, 
So it's a pool of people. Of the body of Christ say that they fast once a year. 80% of people fast once a year. And it's usually corporately, which is great. Nothing against that. But if that's the only time that we're fasting and putting ourselves in a position to hear from God clearly, I guarantee that there is something or some kind of shortcoming happening somewhere in your life, whether you're aware of it or not. People in Scripture fasted all the time. There's so many places that you would see prayer and fasting coupled with each other. You see it. And they just, it was just understood that if I'm going into prayer from something, I'm going to go into fasting as well because I don't need anything hindering my ability to hear the voice of the Lord. I don't want anything blocking that. And so I had a, a couple of examples of people fasting. And guys, there's a lot, a lot of examples of people fasting in Scripture. And I was reading through Esther. And in Esther 4, verse 16, where she was contemplating, she was wanting to go to the king to make a request on behalf of her people. And she didn't know how to do it. And some might even say she was a little nervous about doing it. And so in verse 16, she said, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. Have you ever fasted on behalf of someone else that said, man, there's something on your life? Or somebody going to you and saying, man, I got this thing. Can you fast for me? Time out. You want me, you want me to not eat? Like, I'll pray for you. I could come in agreement with what God's going to do, but you want me to not eat or drink either? Hey, man, I, you know. I got this thing I got to do. I got dinner plans tomorrow, dog. Can I like, can we start Tuesday? She went and she told a group of people, not just one person, a whole group of people and said, hey, what the Lord is calling me to do is going to impact everyone. You may not know what to do. You may not be the one going to talk to the king. So your role right now is to just fast. Well, what, what do we do? Fast, pray. Ask, the God, ask God for favor, for me. This is affecting y'all too. Okay. And we see in the end of that, they fast, they're finished, and obviously we know the king ends up granting her request. And then there's another story um, in Acts, Acts chapter 13, that I love. It's talking about Paul and Barnabas. They're doing ministry. They're traveling, doing all kinds of amazing things. And in Acts 13, verse 1, it says, Now there was, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. While they were worshiping and fasting, they didn't even know what they were worshiping and fasting for. They just knew that that was an ingredient to move the heart of God to clear things up for them to know the instruction of what to do next. So in the midst of them worshiping and fasting, they hear a word from the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas, I got a task for them, and they need to be sent out. All right. So they go and tell them, and it says, after fasting and praying, oh, it says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Worship and prayed, fasted, got a word from the Holy Spirit, fasted and prayed again, laid hands and sent them off. The Holy Spirit didn't tell Paul and Barnabas where they were going to go be sent off to. He told the group of people that worship and fasted. 
They said, hey, we may not be going and traveling and all that stuff. I might be too old to go out there in these dunes and dusty streets and, and, and perform miracles and lay hands on people. But y'all can go. And if I'm not doing it, I guess that my role is to pray and to fast until I hear the Holy Spirit say something. And until then, even if I go about my normal task, I'm thinking, man, I need to go back and pray and fast. I need to go back and pray and fast. I need a word. I need a word. What is my role in revival? What is the thing that God is telling you or speaking to you or has spoken over you that you need to say, God, I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast for this thing right here. And I'm not going to move until you say something. And if I have to move, then I'm going to anticipate when I get to go back until you say something. And I want to make that my role because I'm not out here doing things that other people maybe have the time to do or privilege to do. And, and it's easy to maybe become envious or maybe become jealous or maybe experience a level of bitterness or something. And God's saying, pray and fast. This affects you, too. What's your role in that? And um, in prep for this, really wild, um, I remember, and it's cool because I found it, uh, I'll, I'll read some of it. I found it in the notes of my phone. Praise God for um, technology and, and praise God for Apple. Does, does Android got like a note section that goes to the cloud? You what? Yeah, you know, you know, had 18 bug fixes. Um, <laughs> so... I went back, and I remember going to this youth camp. I went to Discovery Camp in the summer of 2011 uh, for the first time as a leader. It was my second year going, first time being a leader. And I'm here at this camp. They do a night called Prayer Culture. And it's a night where it's the last night of the camp. It's a five-day camp. Everybody's praying. Everybody's in this moment. Everybody's just in a, in a right place for harvest. And... I remember watching our group. We used to take a group of 70 to 80 kids to Chris uh, was on a lot of those trips. You got to stay up with all the boys late night, be the, be the muscle. Pastor Jason was just, was like, ah, oh, let them do whatever they want. <laughs> Chris was like, somebody's got to be the adult. <laughs> so it was fun. <laughs> Sorry you got stuck in there. <laughs> and then I felt like when I, when I came in, came alongside Chris when Pastor Jason, Pastor Courtney became associate pastors. It was like he traded one thing for the exact same thing. We're at camp. It's like, hey, we got to make sure people are going to bed. I'm like, yeah, you got that. Come on, fun. Wake up. <laughs> Come on, it's a party. Anyways, I'm, back, I'm at this camp. It's prayer culture night. I'm sitting watching people worship. And, you know, I'm worshiping like, God, what do you want? Lord. And I'm new. I'm a, I'm a year and a half in the game. God, what do you want to do? This is cool. What happens now? Holy. And all of a sudden, this little kid comes up to me. Taps me and he says, I think it was one of, it might have been one of like Pastor Gabe's kids or something. A little short. Got to play keys. But kid comes up to me and he says, hey, can I pray for you? I was like, okay, and literally tells me to come down to his level. So I get on my knees, and he, like, puts his hand over my shoulder, and this little kid starts wrecking my entire life. <laughs> this was the first time that I'd ever, like, heard a word from the Lord, got a word, been, like, prophesied over outside of me getting saved in, in the Walmart and Vanilla Wafer story. But outside of that, this is the first time post being accepting Christ that I'd got a word from the Lord. And, I mean, this kid was going in, going in, talking about my family, talking about all this stuff. And, like, young kid, and he says, oh, and I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord saying Romans 12, 5. And I was, at that point, I didn't know zero scripture. And this little kid was, like, spouting it out. I feel the Lord saying Romans 12, 5 over you and that. You're going to be, uh, he wants to use you. Actually, I wrote it down. Okay, I did not speak as eloquently uh, in 2011, I actually don't really speak that eloquently now, but I said, hey, yo, <laughs> I, got, I got this word from this kid that was seven years old. 
I ain't never, ever have nothing like that happen before. Nothing. N-U-T-T-I-N. Praise God. He came and asked if he could pray for me, and when he did, I kneeled down, and he started saying different scriptures from the Bible that I did not know. He mentioned my family, me at school. He even talked about what I struggled with, all of that. He said that God was calling me to bring people to work together for Jesus, and not just people from my own church, but people from all over that love the Lord. He said Romans 12, 5. I got to look that up because I don't know what it says. And he said that when I work with other people, it makes God happy, that that's what I'm supposed to do, that God's going to use me in a great way to do things not just in the church, but outside of the church. I'm not sure what happened, but it felt really weird, and I'm going to have to talk to Pastor Jason. And I put Brian about it, which <laughs> those that know Brian Laura, praise God. I said, I'm going to have to talk to Pastor Jason and Brian about it. So a seven-year-old, the summer of 2011, gave me a word. And pause real quick. Stop counting your kids out from prophetic moves of God. I remember asking his mom, who led worship there, I was like, man, your kid did this. How, what? That was so amazing. And she was like, yeah, his dad's in the living room hearing from God all the time. And they join him. And they pray. And they practice hearing the Lord. And I was like, oh. Seven-year-old, you could do that? Absolutely. Like, what you mean? They don't have any barriers of life experience or negative shortcomings or doubt or anything. They can just be open and wide and say, God, are you saying something? Cool. And they'll go up to you nonchalant. Hey, this is what the Lord said. Yeah. And then walk away. And you over here like, really? <laughs> like, I was bawling in this kid's arms. 2011. And I want to show y'all <laughs> a couple, a couple clips. Um, Yvonne, you can play that first clip, just the first one. Romans 12, 5 says, So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So why can't we come together and worship? Why can't we come together in prayer? Why can't we come together as one body in Christ? To pray together. To praise Baby together. Chi. This isn't about a church name. So how much more effective can building God's kingdom become when we do it together as one? Well? So I encourage pastors to come out. I encourage youth to come out. And we're going to pray together. We're going to worship together. And we're going to be together as one body united in Christ. So let's build the kingdom. So I show you this because I received the word from God. I didn't know at the time that that was like, going to mark and change the trajectory of my life for the next decade plus. Received the word. I said, I don't know what to do with this word. I'm going to be doing stuff with other people and other churches and other what? Y'all, we got back from camp. This was 2011, summer. From August of 2011 to January of 2012, I went door to door to youth ministries around the city and just pulled up because we met on Sunday night. So every Wednesday, for two, three months, I pulled up to another youth group. Just showed up. No plan. Just showed up. And I'm a leader, so you got youth pastors like, what you doing with my kids? Like, hey, you're not recruiting my kids. I pulled up. I'd be a part of the service, and i say, hey, I just feel like God really wants to do something different in the city. Can we, like, what does it look like for us to work together? I got this Roman 12, 5 thing in my head. I just can't shake it. What does it look like? We the one body are many. Different ones every week. And I went by myself. <laughs> like, I just went. And so that video was birthed out of some of those the youth leaders and stuff that I encountered. They were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And I was like, yeah, we're going to have our own prayer culture. Let's do it. We're going to have it at our youth building. And it may be at somebody else's church next time. Y'all, we had this event, and four people showed up. And three of them were in that video. <laughs> and we prayed for five hours that God would do something in our city and that he would use us to do it. And for the next year or so, we went different churches. We had different things. We were doing things, building community. Now it's a season just from a kid, a seven-year-old kid. Show that next picture, Yavara. So after that, I can't see. If you can see, I'm in a little orange hat right there. <laughs> Again, I didn't know what to do. This was about 2014. 
And um, I remember going and talking to a guy from High Ridge Church out in Benbrook. And I was like, man, I had this word, Romans 12, 5, I can't shake it, I can't shake it. What does that look like? What do I have? What's my role? It's like, oh, I just learned to play guitar on YouTube University. I said, cool, what if we just went out and just worship and see what happens? And so we did, and we had around 120 people come out randomly. We're praying for them. People are getting healed. People are moving. All the things are happening. Show that next picture, Yvonne. So we went back the next week, and there was over 500 people out there that were like, man, we heard people talk about what y'all did last week, and we had to come see for ourselves. And I still had an orange hat in this. You could probably, I don't, oh, yeah, you, uh, you, maybe you can see it somewhere. We, 500 people. The police came. They were like, nah, nah, we can't do all of this. And so for the next, like, year and a half or so, we said, awesome, what does it look like to stir something up in this capacity? All from a word I got from a seven-year-old, that this is, that's, that's your role. That's your role. Go to the next one, Yvonne. I have no idea what it is. Oh, so this was, I had Dylan and Liz are in that photo. So this was 2016, I believe, um, got in contact uh, with a buddy of mine through one of the people in this photo. And I was like, man, Romans 12, 5, what does it look like to be a part in a body? And so every month, we would go to brood, and we would just circle up, and we'd pray. And we'd say, God, do something in our city. Go to the next one. There's a few of them. I'll move quicker. And then it turned into, this is 2016 or 17 also. And so that turned into, oh, man, we're going to go in these people's houses, and we're going to do this thing, and we're going to see what that Romans 12, 5 word looks like in this season. We're going to see what this is going to turn into because I got a word from a seven-year-old that <laughs> said, this is your role. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. I'm going to move quick. I'm going to move quick. Every millennial to get engaged. Meet your council person. Come meet the mayor. Offer something back to the city and make it a better city than it is now. <laughs> Mayor Price, everyone, millennials get engaged. Ooh, I see them glasses, engaged. praise God. I've been redeemed by the Son of Man. But, again, got this word, and I was like, hey, well, how can we do this in our city? We showing up to town council meetings, dressed like that, pulling up to all things. It was in that season, same word, different vehicle. Same word, different vehicle. Go to the next one. I think there's a few more. I'll move through these quickly. And so, in about 2018 or so, our Pastor Jason and Courtney in the show, I think y'all are. And so, uh, we got, <laughs> we got um, long story short, got favor, got in um, the founders of Hobby Lobby. We're at their headquarters. There's about 25 of us from all over the nation. And the founder of Hobby Lobby, David Green, is looking at us and he says, what, ha what needs to happen in the body of Christ? And I'm thinking... A seven-year-old told me exactly what I need to do. It's like, man, if we can get people from other churches, other things, doing stuff together, we can make something happen. And David Green goes, great, here's a blank check. And we took eight groups of like 30 pastors up to D.C. with their wives, got to hang out with them. They built relationships, did awesome things, and came back. We're going to these lunches. Julie went to a lot of those lunches and things. We're doing all this stuff with these pastors yeah, COVID happened and kind of put a wrench in some stuff. But doing those things, pastors are getting together. Churches are doing it together. Go to the next one. I like 10 more minutes. This is from that same trip. We're praying for senators and Congress people in the Capitol. A group of pastors. Go to the next one. This is me talking to the group of pastors uh, at the Lincoln Memorial and telling them the same thing. What would happen? Romans 12, 5, we though many are one body, each belonging to one another, mutually dependent on one another explaining them that, man, if we were just to come together, what would happen? In, and these are all local pastors. What would happen in our city if we were to come together? Could we potentially see revival in our time if we were to come together? Go to the next one. And then, different season, same vehicle. We got to start a band with people from different churches. You see Julia over there on the left, praising, praising God. 
is that Brenna? And Brenna. And so we have this band, six or seven, eight different churches, people in the band. Same thing, Romans 12, 5. We, though many, are one body. I said, what does that look like? This was 2019. Go to the next one. And then God's expanding that. This is a group of 50 of us in Dubai with believers from 47 different countries coming together and saying, what would happen if we all got together and worked together? Unfortunately, this is the day that I got in an ATV accident, (laughs) broke my shoulder. But praise God. Before that, fun. So great. Got to lead worship out there. But to hear people from different tribes and different nations crying out to the Lord and saying, do it with us. Do it with us. Knowing what our roles is. I think there's one more. Are you going to skip that one? Same concept. And same, I mean, worship best. I just really like that photo. <laughs> same concept. And uh, you can go back. You can go back. Or just you can hit the, hit the deal. I'm good. You don't have to show me more photos anymore. <laughs> But same word, different vehicle. And I just had a realization not too long ago. I was like, oh, hearing talks of all this revival and God saying, man, or me saying, man, God, what is my role? It's like, oh, seven-year-old told you 12 years ago what your role in revival was. I was like, oh, yeah, and then got to go back and see time and time again how that word was manifested, how the word and the role didn't change, how it didn't change at all. This is the role in revival. Get people, gather people, do this, be a part of this, and it's still happening. Same word different vehicles. So again, I'm asking, write down, what is your role in revival? What is your role? I remember uh, Tracy talking to me and, and saying, man, like, I, I'm not like a worshiper. I love to worship, but I'm not singing or playing. And she got in a moment where she was fasting and praying. I was like, man, God, what's my role? And I remember when she got up super excited and was like, oh, the Lord said I'm supposed to be praying and interceding. I'm supposed to be praying and interceding. Like, that's my role. And now, again, to see the different vehicles that God is using to bring that role to pass, because not everybody's going to lead worship. Some people are going to be praying and fasting for those that are being sent. And it's not a lesser role. In any capacity, there's some of us in here that are waiting for some of y'all to pray and fast like in Acts 13, to hear a word to then deliver from us, or deliver to us, rather. We're waiting for that, to say, man, there's no sideline in what we're doing. There's no sideline in what God wants to do when it comes to revival. We are waiting for everybody to grab their hammer. And say, I may be a jeweler, a high priest, a perfume maker, a teacher, a businessman, but I have a role when it comes to revival. And if the very least I can do is pray and fast and commit to praying and fasting for those that maybe have a freer schedule to do the things of God, then so be that. Pray and fast. And the last two things, I'm going to move through this quick. Recipes for revival. Last two things. Holiness. Holiness is one. Holiness is one. Pastor Jason talked about this a few weeks ago when he shared the vision um, of what he was talking about, of what the Lord was sharing with him, that we have to pursue holiness in a way that we've never pursued it before. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, it says, strive for peace with everyone. Some of y'all disqualify right there. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness. The author of Hebrews said, without this, you will not see the Lord. Without holiness. And I remember praying about this and I felt the Lord was saying, I think people need to have a more extreme approach when it comes to holiness. 
I ain't going to be mad if it's more extreme. Do you want to see me or not? Is anything outside of holiness worth not seeing me? Y'all, the world is getting crazier. And the crazy part about it is nobody's denying that fact. There's not a person that's like, no, nah, it's chill. It's normal. You know? Maybe we'll have a war this year. Don't worry about it. And we say and read about these things and hear about these things, especially being a part of this house, when we get first and firsthand and inside info with things that are happening prophetically around the world, and we're still not moved to do something additional because we don't even know what are we supposed to do. Yeah, I love it. I want to be able to have two knee patches somewhere in my house in 30 years that somebody can come back and say, oh, man, that person was marked by prayer and by fasting. And maybe somebody would kneel in those same steps and say, do it again, Lord, through me. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. And there's a, one more scripture in John 11. This is Jesus um, is being persecuted for performing works, for preaching the gospel. And he's in Judea. And he gets to a point in verse 54. And it says, therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Will we get to a point where our response to revival is so minimal that the Holy Spirit then goes, I just can't move publicly there anymore then? Jesus said, I, I'm no longer going to move publicly in this space. Because the response to the works of God that are happening, the response to the gospel that's being preached, the response to the revival that's breaking out in this place is not great. So Jesus goes, cool. I just won't move publicly then. He was present, but his power was no longer public. We're experiencing revival all around the nation. There are churches locally that in this past week met and had prayer nights every night because people in their church were like, I don't know what's happening, but I need a piece. I need to get in on that. Every night. And our response is sometimes, oh, you know, that revival seems cool and all, but I probably would have did it this way. Or I probably would have said this. Or I don't know just how effective eight days can be. How do you control that? Like, what? We hear about these dudes having revival and stuff for 40 days. And we want to be experts on how God doesn't move. All the while dry as ever in our own spiritual lives, wanting revival so heavy. And we're criticizing the nature and tactic and way that God's moving in another area. While others are saying, man, we need that. Do it, do it, do it here. And they're experiencing it, and healing is breaking out. We had several friends go out to Asbury. It wasn't even a, a spirit-filled school. And they're seeing people being freed from demonic possession. Healings are breaking out. People are being restored and set free. Addictions are being broken. You're hearing these stories coming out of places like this. And other people responding in a sense to saying, man, do it again right here. I don't know what I can do. I could pray, though, with intentionality. I can fast with intentionality. I can do all of these things and say, God, if this is going to be my role in revival, I want to take it seriously as if the body depends on it. I want to invite my kids into it. I want to invite my family into it. I want to invite my church family into it and say that we will see revival here. It's happening already. The question is not whether if it's going to happen or not. It's, is it going to happen with you? Is it going to move through you? Is it, are you going to put yourself in a position that says, God, whatever it is, 
I'm not going to compare it to something else. I'm not going to shine it up against something else. Give me, what is my role in revival? Don't let me discredit what you're doing. I don't want to try to frame how you're going to do something. Just give me the word and I'll be open to whatever that looks like, whatever it is. And I feel like God's going to call a lot of y'all to fasting, honestly. But actually, intentionally fasting and getting in a position that says, man, God, I may not be physically being sent out in this capacity, but give me a word. Give me a word that can change the trajectory of somebody's life. Bring a seven-year-old that's bold and courageous to go up to a big 6'2 dude and say, can you come down, down here to my level so that I can give you something that the Lord told me? Get into a position where you're outside of the presence of God and you can't do anything until you get back in it. God, your omnipresence isn't enough. I want your manifested presence. I want your manifested presence here, now, in this place. You're ready, you're willing, you're moving. Um, Y'all stand up with me real quick. Yeah, I just want to pray um, for the roles of revival. And um, I just say I will. Last, last point, and I'll just talk about it as we close, is discipleship. Discipleship. I find it interesting that one of Jesus' last words and commands um, isn't one of our top priorities. And if we even look around in this room, there are, which is wild because it's pretty, I feel like it's pretty mixed, but there are a plethora of young people here who are waiting for someone to fast and pray on their behalf. And so if you are somebody who is older, who's been walking with the Lord, who feels like you have a prayer life that's active, I am challenging you to find one of these people and commit, commit, commit to saying, I'm not sure what it looks like yet, but I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast for you specifically. Specifically. Take a minute. Y'all are looking at me. Take a minute. Look around. Just look around. Look, look. There's young people all around this room. There's young adults all around this room. There's a lot of us. We need to be covered by y'all. Period. We need to be covered by y'all. We don't want to wait for another seven-year-old. That would be amazing. But we have so many people right here in this room that have testimonies beyond measure of the goodness of God. And you have young people wondering what God wants to do with us next. Find one today. I'm going to pray and dismiss. And if everybody just walks out in the lobby, we're going we to put a stick on the doors. <laughs> Find one. And I'm saying it 88 times so you catch it. We need y'all to cover us. Y'all know the world's getting crazier for us. Y'all with grade school kids know the world's getting crazier. Why would we leave it up to chance when we have the Holy Spirit who's desperately wanting to move publicly and be manifested in us so that we will, in fact, see revival so that we can get in a posture that says, do it again, Lord, through me. So, Father, we just thank you for what you're doing. God, we thank you that you never stopped moving. God, that we may have just stopped seeing it for whatever reason. And so, Father, put, a, put something inside of us that stirs us up. Let your Holy Spirit be active in us. God, as we, we pray for revival, let us define what revival means for us, what our own roles for revival are. And God, once you reveal that thing to us, let us pursue that with everything that we are. 
God, let this be a house that has children that prophesy. Let this be a house that has kids that have dreams and visions, God, and give prophetic words to those that change the trajectory of people's lives, God. Let this be a house that has older people pouring in to the young people that you are calling and sending out, Father. Let this be a house filled with people that are praying and fasting on behalf of what you're doing in this church and what you're doing in this city, Father. Let this be a house of people that are hungry for a move of you. God, let this be a house of people that anytime they're not in prayer or don't feel like they're in your presence, that they would be moved to a point of discomfort until they got back to that space, Father. God, we want to see you move here and now. We want to see it. We want to experience it, God. We don't want to see it firsthand we don't want, or secondhand. We don't want to see it later or find out about it later. later. We don't want to just hear about what you're doing, God. We want to be a part of that process. We want to be a part of that equation, God. We want to be the ones that you're moving around and moving through in this. And so, God, we thank you that you are convicting us for our response to revival and that you would move us to say, do it again through us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.